Well, with this lecture, we move away from the Roman Republic and into the early days of the Roman Empire. Now, if you're watching this lecture online, I'd like you to go to the video first. It provides, I think, a really good introduction to the reign of Augustus. Now, the Roman painting lecture actually took us a little out of sequence, since the later Pompeii paintings, for example, the fourth style paintings, were actually made in the reign of Nero. Vesuvius erupted in 79 CE. Augustus ruled from 27 BCE to 14 CE. Uh, if you just try to remember his date as zero, it will stick in your mind more easily. I thought the video did a good job of highlighting Augustus's career, and I just want to emphasize a few points. Equaled only perhaps by Napoleon, Augustus was the, was history's great master of using art as political propaganda as a tool not only to express, but actually to bolster his power and authority. He probably noted the mistakes of his famous uncle, Julius Caesar. At any rate, he not, did not repeat them. So he treated the Roman patricians, especially the senators, with flawless respect that almost disguised the reality that he had stripped them of all but symbolic power. He consciously manipulated the public's desire to return to the, frankly, somewhat mythical days of the virtuous republic. But he also recognized that he simply couldn't use age and experience to justify the legitimacy of his rule, as the Republican leaders had. Remember those statues, uh, the portrait busts, where, if anything, the, the wrinkles and the look of age is exaggerated? Augustus simply couldn't pull that off when he was just 20 years old when he first assumed power as part of a triumvirate of rulers and was just 28 when he became Rome's sole ruler. So he turned to another tradition— Ancient Greece. So, I hope you recognize, by the way, the statue on the right. Uh, what's another word for Doriferous? It's the spear carrier, missing the spear. Uh, and the artist was? Polyclitus, the author of the canon. In fact, his title for this work was canon. So what similarities do you see between the two famous statues? And what differences do you see and why do those differences exist? Let's start with similarities. Well, the idealized male bodies are very similar. Uh, look at the legs and feet, for example. Uh, in fact, they're even positioned in much the same way. And both figures, of course, have that manly chest with the uh, well-honed pecs. Uh, similarly, I would say that they eat, each statue has a stern but beautiful face. On the other hand, there's a very important difference in the face. What is it? Well, Augustus is facing forward at his audience, uh, and his hand, perhaps even more significantly, is extending out into negative space toward the people uh, that he's ruling. And Augustus is also, of course, you know, to point out the obvious, wearing clothes. And why is he wearing clothes uh, when, the, when the statue that he's modeling his statue on is not? Well, one answer is that his army uniform carries a lot of symbols, and we're going to look at that in just a minute. But it's also important to note that Augustus was portraying himself as returning Rome to an age of family values, if you will, a more sexually virtuous period. Uh, and the paterfamilias of the entire empire simply kept his clothes on. Uh, as you heard in the Khan Academy podcast, I hope, uh, there are some other very important symbols in the statue of Augustus. Uh, so what symbols do we see here? And how are they used to enhance Augustus's perceived power and authority? Well, he's carrying the baton of the office of consul. This was not just a symbol of power. It was a symbol of republican power. Again, Augustus claimed to be restoring the public, not creating a new political regime. That's really not true. Uh, he had made, I mean, the Republic was really dead by the time Augustus seized sole control of the empire. Uh, but he never acknowledged that. He never claimed that he was forming an empire. And it was really later emperors who would claim that title. He's wearing the costume of a general. That's the imperator, which actually means commander of the Roman army, uh, not emperor, as we would understand the term now. That actually derived from Augustus's use of that term for being commander-in-chief. Uh, by the way, the leather fringe that you see in the 
bottom right-hand corner uh, was part of the military uniform. Now, the general's costume harkens to his military career. Uh, and in fact, military historians don't actually think Augustus was a very good general, but he had the good sense to employ an excellent general, Agrippa, and to take credit for his victories. Augustus was always all about seizing the propaganda advantage. Now, the relief on the breastplate, or cuirass as it's called, advertises the return of the Roman military standards that the Parthians, that's, those are the successors of the per to the Persians in the east, had captured from Augustus's rival Crassus. So this is a chance to dig at his rival, uh, but also to point out that under Augustus, Rome's uh, honor, if you will, had been restored in battle. And there are some allusions to various Roman deities, including Mars, who was the god of war, uh, as well as personifications of the latest territories that have been conquered by Augustus, Hispania, uh, Moor of Gaul, Germania, and Parthia in the east. The Cupid symbolized what? The Julian family's alleged descent from Venus. Cupid was another of Venus's sons. Augustus, by the way, himself never claimed to be a god. Typically, he hinted at this claim without quite making it, maintaining the fiction that he was preserving the Republic and not transforming it into an empire. Uh, by the way, his bare feet, which seems a little odd considering he was wearing a general's uniform, uh, was another subtle hint of his godlike state. Gods were depicted barefoot in sculptures. The statue that you have in your textbook that you just saw on the slide is one of many, many copies of the statue, a little like president's portraits hanging in federal offices all over the country. These would have been everywhere. Uh, the statue that we have in our book, again, that you've just seen, was discovered in the 1800s, and at the and at the time, there were still traces of paint on the statue. So a workshop at the Vatican Museum has actually used those traces to try to recreate what the statue would have looked like originally, again, one of the many models that would have been floating around the empire, and this is what you see, apparently based on the scientific analysis. This is pretty close to the colors that they would have used. Yes, there were also a lot of portraits of Augustus's wife. Uh, she is rather a fascinating figure in her own right. Augustus fell in love with her when she was still married to one of his political and military rivals and pregnant with the rival's child. Augustus was also married. Uh, they both divorced their spouses, married each other, and they would remain married for 51 years. Uh, Augustus and Livia were a very good propaganda team. They set out quite consciously to establish themselves as a role model for Roman households. Despite all their wealth and power, Augustus's family continued to live modestly in their home on the Palatine Hill. Uh, Livy, Livia, in fact, would set the pattern for the noble Roman matrona, matron. She didn't wear a whole lot of jewelry, and her clothes were elegant but simple. Uh, she made sure everyone knew that she took care of the household, and she often even made her husband's clothes. Uh, in 35 BC, Octavian, by the way, gave Livia the unprecedented honor of ruling her own finances and dedicated a public statue to her. We've mentioned that women did not have, for the most part, a very high status in Rome. Augustus's wife was an interesting exception. Now, the couple had no children of their own, but the next emperor, Tiberius, was Livia's son uh, and therefore Augustus's stepson. Livia was also the paternal grandmother of the emperor Claudius, the paternal great-grandmother of the emperor Caligula, and the maternal great-great-grandmother of the emperor Nero. Uh, not actually, as it turns out, a real impressive group of emperors to have descended from her. Uh, note that these sculpture portraits span many of the 51 years of the marriage. Her hairstyle changes with the fashion, but she remains perpetually young. At least her face does. Lucky lady. Okay, you're about to get hit in the... Uh, following two lectures with a whole slew of Roman monuments, and almost all of these will be monuments to victory in one of Rome's many imperial wars. But this one, quite deliberately, is an exception. 
By the time Augustus took power as princeps, which simply means first citizen, it is the root of our word prince, and imperator, which again is commander-in-chief, and a little later, pontifex maximus, or high priest, uh, Rome had been embroiled in civil wars for a century. The citizens were tired of war, and they were eager for a stable, predictable rule, especially by an emperor who didn't claim to be an emperor, claimed to just be restoring the republic. So this was a monument that celebrated peace, the Pax Augusti, or what was later called the Pax Romana. And by the way, it was largely in pieces uh, when it was reconstructed by Mussolini in connection with the 2000th anniversary of Augustus's birth. Uh, and then it represented, of course, Mussolini's own ambition to refound the Roman Empire with himself pretty much as Caesar. Uh, here we see a few details from this famous altar. So the bottom frieze is decorated with acanthus tendrils and figural reliefs of the royal family in procession. We'll see a little more, more of the procession later on. Uh, but the procession almost certainly imitates the Panathenaic procession frieze in the inner cello wall, the Parthenon. Again, Augustus was eager to have his reign associated with the Golden Age of Pericles. So this, this similarity was certainly not any kind of an accident. Really, nothing that Augustus did in terms of having his reign portrayed in art was accidental at all, served to reinforce his power and authority and regime. Uh, one of the reliefs on the top portion of the altar showed a seated matron with two surprisingly realistic squirmy babies on her lap. Uh, usually she's identified as Tellus, or Mother Earth, but she might have been Ceres, the goddess of the harvest. What she really represents, almost certainly, is the bounty of the Earth when the country is not being racked by war, and also probably Augustus's uh, desire, which was then embodied in Roman law, that Roman families get down to the serious business of making more babies to defend and run the empire. That was actually part of his effort to restore uh, sexual mores. Another frieze shows Aeneas, remember, allegedly Augustus's ancestor, making a sacrifice to the gods. Virgil, the poet who wrote the Aeneid, actually worked for Augustus, was on his payroll. And this famous epic poem was, frankly, another great propaganda work. In fact, many of the great works in Latin were produced during Augustus's reign, uh, were paid for by the, you know, from out of the government budget and were consciously ordered, basically, uh, to reinforce the rule of Augustus. Oops, there we go. Uh, here we get a closer look at that procession frieze and a comparison with the Panathenaic procession frieze. By the way, this is a juxtaposition that the college board would love. I would not be at all surprised to see the two processions as a short essay or image-based multiple choice subject. So how are the two processions similar? <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, the composition is quite similar, a procession along a frieze, and so are the detailed descriptions of the depictions of the clothing. In both cases, the drapery is very carefully uh, composed. But how are they different? Well, the procession on the Arapaches captures a specific event the dedication of the altar, whereas the Panathenaic procession was an event that occurred every four years. But what's actually in some ways more interesting is that the royal family is portrayed as interacting with one another as a family. We even see children who are tugging on cloaks. Uh, art historians debate over why kids show up in this frieze and almost no other friezes. But one theory is that, again, Augustus was pushing fertility. Men with family set a moral example, and he was leading the way. <clears throat> Augustus is famous for saying that he found Rome a city of bricks and left it a city of marble. Uh, specifically, by the way, the white Carrara marble from quarries that have recently opened. Until then, Rome didn't really have a reliable source of marble, and so marble was reserved for you know, major statues and not for entire buildings. Uh, Augustus's forum was filled with symbols of his family and sculpture that imitated the works of ancient Greece. Unfortunately, all that survives of Augustus's forum are a few scattered blocks of marble. This temple in southern France, Nîmes, in, in uh, the 
in Provence in southern France did survive, and it's thought to be a pretty reliable copy of the chief temple in Augustus's forum. So what typically Roman features do you see? Well, you see the pseudo peripteral facade. In other words, you have freestanding columns in front and the front sides, and then engaged columns on the back and side. The columns are what order? A Corinthian. Again, the acanthus leaves are very clear. It may not precisely be an art history subject, but in many ways, the Romans' most impressive architectural feats were not temples or monument. They were reliable paved roads and even more a reliable water system. The world would not see plumbing up to Roman standards until near the end of the 19th century. For that matter, they wouldn't see bathing up to Roman standards until then either. Here we see the famous three-tier Pont du Gard, also from Nîmes in southern France. It delivered 100 gallons of water a day for each inhabitant of Nîmes from a source 30 miles away, an incredible engineering feat. There were no pumps. It worked entirely by gravity, driving the water down to the cities, which is why the Romans needed aqueduct bridges uh, to continue the water's downhill path as it crossed rivers and streams. The downhill isn't really that obvious, but you kind of get a feeling there in the picture on the left, just of the very slight decline that would keep the water moving. Uh, there's also a picture that indicates the concrete lining on the upper part, and the framework you see in the bottom right gives you uh, a sense of how archers were constructed because basically they wouldn't hold together reliably until that final keystone was put into place. On the other hand, one of the things that made these great uh, aqueducts and bridges possible was that concrete could be poured into molds that were that would be sunk down into the water. I mean, the concrete itself was poured from above the water, but it made possible... Uh, the construction of these massive bridges, again, a tribute to Roman engineering and to it, the brilliant invention of concrete. Um, the aqueduct, this aqueduct was built at the point where Rome's two greatest roads converged. So here you see a couple of terms you should know. An attic is the uppermost story of the aqueduct where the water channels ran. And rusticated machinery is that, a uh, masonry, excuse me, is that rough edge, basically combined smooth and rougher surfaces. It was basically designed to give a, a more varied appearance. It was a, an artistic feature rather than a, a engineering necessity. I wish I had time to talk more about the emperors who succeeded Augustus. They're a interesting and rather weird lot. With the partial exception of Claudius, they ranged from cruel and tyrannical to cruel, tyrannical, and totally nuts. They also, unlike Augustus, made no effort to disguise their new role as emperors and the demise of the Republic. So Caligula, for example, famously made his beloved horse a priest. Uh, and although this is more likely to be a legend, it's, it's claimed that he threatened to make his horse consul. He certainly killed off most of his relatives. All of these emperors spent lavishly on their own personal homes. When much of Rome burnt down in a fire during the reign of Nero, it was rebuilt again, largely in more fireproof concrete. We'll see some of the wonderful results from this public works project before long. But this slide shows the spectacular home that Nero built for himself. The most famous room is the domed octagonal hall built of concrete with a stucco veneer and gilded with lots and lots of precious gold. Architects, again, were beginning to realize the potential of concrete to open up space and move beyond rectilinear lines. And in our next lecture, we will look at the most famous example of this and the in really the most impressive dome building that would be built until the Italian Renaissance. So we will move in our next lecture to the golden age of the Roman Empire and the rule of the Flavians.